There it is. I had it on mute, which is the way most people like to hear me, mute. Amy Carmichael's thought and vision of what was happening on the mission field is so very true. We have a world around us that is marching blindly into hell. And all too often, we sit around doing the religious thing, making daisy chains, and reproving those who are out to reach the lost. Kind of piggybacking on last week's message about Australia and Nepal. Do this. Drive you crazy, won't they? I don't plan to move around a lot, and this thing will put up a long thing, but back to our thoughts. All too often, you may want to turn that lapel or the handheld mic down, slide it down. It's, I hear a pretty good ring and my voice is pretty loud. Today I want to talk about our commitment to lost people. As I said before, Amy Carmichael saw multitudes perishing over the end of the pit while the church sat around in the shade trees with their back to those who are going to hell making daisy chains. You see, we have a problem in that we all too often fail to witness. So many Christians never share the gospel with those who are lost. To a point where you often wonder, do they really know the Lord Jesus? All too often, we have an attitude that, like the person praying, me, my wife, my son, and my daughter, we four, no more. Too often we worry about how we're going to pay the rent more than how we are going to reach the lost around us. Many have never shared how they were saved. Many have never shared how that lives can change. And yet I read statistics. More people are brought to Christ through a personal invitation than any other means. Whether it's a pastor that invited them to come to Christ or whether it is some program that they have seen. I believe the number is 70% of the people who come to a church come by personal invitation. I also believe that 70% of the people who come to Christ come through a personal invitation. And yet, beloved, we have a responsibility to share the message. We are held accountable to share the message. I'd like to turn your thoughts to Ezekiel 33. And I'm going to be going to a number of places in the scripture. I hope you'll bear with me as I do this. But in Ezekiel 33, verse 2, the scripture says, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land, the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming from the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning. If the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for those for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them. When I say the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you shall not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. 
Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. God told Ezekiel that he had a responsibility as a watchman. A responsibility to tell those who are perishing that they are perishing to turn from their evil ways and turn to God. And he said, listen, if you warn them and they don't listen, that's on them. But if you fail to warn them, it's on you. Paul, when he stood before the council, he said, my, my hands are, the, are free of the blood of all men. Romans chapter 10, that beautiful scripture that says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich on all who call upon him. On all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring good tidings of good things. Beloved, our churches are falling apart. Not only numerically, but spiritually. Because we have failed to see the need of lost people around us. We are content to attend church. We're intent, content to do the religious thing. But we're very much like the disciples in John chapter 4. Remember the story? Jesus is sitting at the well with a woman who is marked by her sin. And he is sharing the gospel with her that he is Messiah and that she can trust in him. In the process of this, she came to know Jesus as her personal Savior. You see, because her reaction was she went to win people. But here's what kills me about this whole story. In verse 27, the disciples had gone into town to get some food. And in verse 27... The disciples came of John 4, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, why do you seek, or who, what do you seek, or what are you asking her? They're going, what's he doing here? And it gets even further, because they bring food, they say, rat teacher, eat, and Jesus says, I have food to eat which you do not know, and verse 33, therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. I fear that we are like the disciples. We just don't get it. We're more interested in our Sunday dinner than we are in the lost people who just have no care for God. And are living their lives, according to Ephesians chapter 2, without hope and without God in this present world. We can blame society. We can blame the age in which we live. We can say it is the last days. But understand as well, not only is the church crumbling, but society is crumbling and affecting the church in a bad way. So that our society sees no problem with sin. Our society sees no problem with theft. Our society, what we call taxation, but our society sees no real problem with turning its back on the living God. And in fact, says that you are the problem. Have you recently heard that the Secret Service has talked about removing their care of the, first, of the second lady, I guess you'd call her, um, Vice President Pence's wife? And they say because she's a Christian. God should take care of it. You understand that we live in a world that has turned its back on God. And I dare say that those who know Jesus are part of the problem. We have listened to the world saying, shut up and sit in your corner 
And when we want your money, we'll ask for it. And when we want your opinion, well, you just keep it to yourself. We realize that we are in trouble in this country because we have failed to reach lost people. I see as well that we have failed to share the gospel accurately. There are myriads of churches around that present sort of a gospel. A gospel light, if you will. There are some churches, their whole scope is feeding hungry people. We're going to take care of hungry people. We're going to get health care to, to sick people. We're going to give sanctuary to those who need it. And they see that being the gospel. That's not the gospel according to this book. There are those that are preaching the gospel of prosperity. God wants you to be rich and healthy and happy. And that if you're really going to get everything God wants you to do, riches are coming. Hey, it plays, way, plays well to the cheap seats, but it's not the gospel. Some have a gospel of syncretism where we mix paganism with Christianity. Just add Christianity to what you believe. You just keep believing the same stuff. And frankly, there's some weird stuff that so-called Christians are believing. That's not the gospel. The gospel is extremely simple and extremely complicated at the same time. The gospel is first and foremost about sin. You cannot be saved until you realize that you are lost. You cannot come to know Jesus until you come to a point where you realize you're hopeless without him. You are absolutely helpless to save yourself. Your sin is separated between you and God. That's part of the gospel. And that Jesus died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15. In other words, Jesus paid the penalty for your sin on the cross. That he rose from the grave. That all you need to do is repent. That, that means to change your mind. Have you noticed when you change your mind about things, it changes what you do as well? I used to drive a Dodge pickup. I changed my mind and I bought a Ford. <laughs> Actually, God just gave me the Ford, and I love the Dodge. But here's what I'm saying. If my mind changes about God and about sin and about salvation, it will change the way I live. And that's what we're missing in the current day and age gospel. Sign your name to the form and you're saved. That may not be true. Pray this prayer after me. By the way, I don't like people to repeat a prayer after me. It should come from their heart when they come to know Jesus. I'll tell them what they should pray about. But then I say, make it your prayer. We need to share the gospel accurately. And we need to share the gospel without fear. You see, the biggest hindrance to sharing the gospel is fear. Some of you guys think, I, I tell a lot of people about Jesus in my life. And some of you think that I just do it it's so easy and natural. That is true, but you know what? I'm scared to death when I do it. My heart is, I had to make sure my mic was off, just beating in my chest. It's in my throat. The, the blood's pounding at my temples. And it's like, I got to tell them, but I'm scared. And I tell them. Joshua 1.8, here's what God told, or Jeremiah 1.8, I'm sorry. Here's what God told Jeremiah. He said, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Don't be afraid of their faces. I've faced down some people in some very frightening situations. We're very hard. And I have to always keep that in my mind. Don't be afraid of their faces. You know what's really interesting? The people that are most hard, as far as I can tell, sometimes are the softest when it comes to the gospel. They're ready to break. You can't tell what's on the inside of a person by what's on the outside of the person. 
You see, we fear rejection. What if they don't like me anymore? I want friends. I want to be popular. I want to be the person that everybody loves. And if you tell people the truth about their life, they may not love you anymore. Realize this. You are a peculiar person anyway. I think um, 1 Peter 2.9 in the New King James says we are a spe- special people of his own. And that's probably the best translation of that verse. You are not the same as the world, and the world is not going to love you. And Jesus told the disciples that not to be concerned when the world hates you, because it hated me before it hated you. And so I'm afraid that I'm going to be rejected. I don't want to be the odd man out. I'm afraid that I'm going to be labeled. You know, the world looks at you as a religious kook. They do. You're strange. You're half bubble off level. I saw earrings. They're, they're levels, and I'm not going there. <laughs> Could wear those, see if you're on a level or not, or half bubble off plum. We fear being labeled. People look at us as some, the same as they do at crazy, crazy people. You know, you don't want people to look at you and think you're just weird and strange and off the wall and, and just something ain't working. You know, lights are on, nobody home. Your fries, you're a bunch of fries short of Happy Meal. You know, you don't want people to think that about you. But if you're going to carry the name of Christian, if you are going to bear the name of Christ, they will think you to be odd. They think it's strange that you don't run in the same excess that they do. Another thing we are afraid of. We're afraid of turning people off to the gospel. I've heard this a lot of times. You know, beloved, you can be obnoxiously forward as a Christian. I know that. I was taught in Bible college, when you're talking to somebody about the Lord, make sure that your breath doesn't smell like you just had an onion sandwich. That's the first thing, you know. Make sure your clothing is neat and appropriate, not like you just pulled it out of a drawer and it's all wrinkled up. That's probably my problem. (laughs) It's the stuff I pull out of a drawer and it's all wrinkled up. And be pleasant. You do not have to be obnoxious to be concerned for the lost or to share the gospel with them. Let me ask you something. Which is worse? To allow someone to go to hell without a word from you or to offend their sensibility by telling them they need to save They're still going to hell. The difference is you have warned them. You know what I found? This kind of fear is always rooted in pride and arrogance. It's always rooted in self and pride. Why do you not like to stand before people in public and speak? Why well, can't can't you know you know why it's about you? I had a friend who I can't pray with people out in public. Well, it's because it's about you. When we fear to speak in private to somebody about their need for Christ, it is the same thing. It is because our pride. We don't want them to think we're weird. It offends our pride. It offends our sense of self. It's hard to be in a crowd and share Jesus with others. How do I get over that fear? How do I overcome this fear to tell people about Jesus? How do I do it? I think 1 John 4 gives us a clue. First John 4, verse 18, says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, 
because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. You know, there's a lot of implications in that. I've spoken to people and I've asked, what would you say to God if you were to stand before him and someone say, I would run like the wind. I'd be so afraid to stand before God. I would be so afraid to speak to God. I would be so afraid to be before him someday. You know why? Because they're afraid of him. But they don't love him. I'm looking forward to standing before Jesus. I'm looking forward to the day when the trumpet call, call is sounded. And I'm caught up to be with the Lord in the air. I'm looking forward to the, to the day when I breathe my last breath here on earth and my first breath will be in the presence of Jesus. I look forward to that because I love Jesus and want to be in his presence. I want to take, you, take that to you with you to the area of evangelism. I think the river is frozen up right now. Might not be on the bridge on the east side of town. There's some rapids there. Imagine if I invited you, you know, the water there is only about this deep. Imagine if we all went down there and said, hey, let's go, let's go jump in the water. How many of you would take me up on that? <laughs> My wife is going to say I have a good cold dip. In fact, we saw that in South Africa. Um, last year, we had all these baseball players lined up on the beach. We were about 10 yards from the beach, and I've got these guys together, and I'm not a great runner. Hey, guys, let's run into the ocean. Let's do it. Let's do it. And we, um, we, a couple of them went down and tipped their toes in the ocean. It was, come on, guys. And we, just for the fun of it, just for a blast, there's only one other young guy that ran in the ocean with me. CJ, we just go running. Everybody's running like they get. Well, they're faster than me for sure. I was just kind of trotting along. They hit the water's edge and it was almost like a cartoon. And only CJ and I went into the water and dove in. You know why? Because we don't like pain. And it's painful when you jump into cold water. If you would jump into the river here, it would be painful. I wouldn't want to do that. But what if we were down there and we saw a three-year-old child being swept down the river? What would you do then? My coat would come off. I'd kick my boots off or maybe not. I would be in that water. You know why? Because my love would overcome my fear. If my grandson was at the zoo, fell into the lion cage, I would not go into a lion cage. I wouldn't recommend you go into a lion cage. I, it's just not my recommendation. You know, lions are there, or tigers, and, and I, I wouldn't recommend, recommend you just jump into that cage. But I'll tell you what, if Zeke is in that lion cage, Grandpa is going to be there right with him. And... Grandpa will get eaten before Zeke will. Because love casts out fear. We talk about loving people. The liberals have taken that word love and I think ruined it. I love you. And then they'll stab you in the back. You know what I'm saying. Genuine love sacrifices for that other person. The key to reaching the loss is to love them first. That love may end up feeding them. That love may end up giving them a ride. That love may end up any kind of a sacrifice. But if you really love the lost, you swallow your pride and you share Jesus with them. 
1 John 4.11 said, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God loved me. I mentioned last week, neighbors from the back side of the section loved me. It's interesting. Um, let me talk to you about my neighbors. They were regular farmers like all of us. They had stock cows. My first introduction, we, we moved to an acreage, oh, I don't know, maybe a half mile from them. We moved to this acreage, and I was out exploring and come upon this old abandoned house. Might have been a schoolhouse. And it had this little machine on the wall. I was going beep, 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 beep. Anybody know what that is? It's a little square box that was on the wall. It had a little beep going. It had a switch that said on and off. It was an electric fencer. I didn't know what it was. It wasn't that all. I just flipped it off. See what it would do. And we were playing around. I forgot about it. That afternoon, our neighbors paid us a call. Merle was not very happy. He was just flat out mad. Mrs. Hill, do you know what your boy done? Because he saw me down there. Your boy turned off the fencer, and the cattle are out. Here's, what, here's how times change. I got a spanking from my mom. Merle didn't think it was hard enough, so I got a spanking from Merle. And Dad got home, and I got a spanking from him. You know what else they did? They hauled this little boy to Awana into Sunday school. I think they said, if we get this kid saved, it's going to make life at a, in our area a whole lot more pleasant. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was a pretty ardent little guy. And because of their love, for neighbors they didn't even know, and frankly, neighbors that just drove them crazy. They were teetotalers, and our clan wasn't. They were good people, our clan wasn't. They were honest people, our clan wasn't. But they loved me enough to get the gospel to me, to where I could come to know Jesus as my Savior. You know, it's a blessing is every once in a while I go back up in that country for a prayer meeting. Led by one of the sons of mine. It's funny. The only word he could use to describe our family was dysfunction. <laughs> but because they loved us, they drew us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We talk about how we want people to be saved. We talk about how we love people, but we don't do anything about it. I almost want to be like, I've never watched a show, Maury, but I guess they're mean that says, um, you know, you say something, but your whatever says that was a lie. We say we love lost people. We say we want people to be saved. We, want, we say we want people to heaven, to go to heaven. But the fact that we don't share Jesus with them tells us that we are lying. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. The love of Christ forces us to see the lost around us. And rather than wringing our hand at their sin, it ought to break our hearts to the point where we share the Lord Jesus with them. The disciples. 
There by the well. There with that tainted woman that Jesus was talking to. And had just headed into town to bring her friends to hear Jesus. Jesus said to them, John 4, verse 35. Do you, not, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. For they are already white for harvest. Lift up your eyes and look. Look at the world around you. All too often, we walk by people and we don't realize they are going to spend eternity somewhere. And if they spend eternity without Jesus, it will be horrible. So horrific that we can't even describe it. We need to tell them. And here's the blessing of telling them. Verse 36 of John 4. He who reaps, receives wages, and gathers fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For then this saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you've not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. There is reward. I'll be honest with you. I like the reaping part. I, I really do. I like it when somebody comes to know Jesus in my presence. Um, you think I'm loud when I'm preaching? Yeah, man, I, I just want to go outside and scream. I enjoy. Just, oh, man. I want to join the angels. You know, the Bible tells us there's joy in the presence of the angels over one soul that repents. That's not the only one that rejoices. What about the one who sowed seed? The one who kept telling about Jesus and never responded. They never responded. And all of a sudden they respond. To me it's a blessing to hear of somebody who's trusted Christ down the road. And you know what's exciting about that? I don't, have, I don't get to take credit for that. I don't get to, Now reaping is fun, but I don't take any credit for it. It's God. Other people are involved in that sowing process. But the end result is that we get reward. And the greatest blessing of all is when someone comes to a point when they know they are sinners destined for the lake of fire and they place their trust in the fact that Jesus died for their sins. That he rose from the dead to give them new life. And they turn from their old life and they turn to Jesus. And that's a time of rejoicing, a time of praise, a time of giving glory to God. You see, love casts out fear. It's scary to talk to people. I talk to some of the scariest people in this world about Jesus. It's scary. And the best thing they can do if they get really mad at you is kill you. <laughs> you know? They can put you in the hospital for a little while. But my love for them forces me to tell them about Jesus, even though they do not love God. It is scary for me to even share Jesus with a young girl, young boy. And yet my love for them forces me to do that. This morning I'm asking you to love the lost. To love people enough to swallow your pride. To step past your fear. And share Jesus with those around you that desperately need him. Greater love has no man than this. Man would lay down his life for his friends. If Jesus loved you that much, how can we not love the lost?
Love your neighbors by sharing Jesus with them. Let's pray. Today, Father, we know that your love casts out fear. Help us to not be afraid, but just to love you and to love our neighbors. And help us to reach out to the lost. Father, help us to draw them to our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.